So, yeah. hey everyone, Diogo Marques here, your friend in sales. Today's session is about helping you guys out when recruiting, when going about recruiting your sales force. And in order to do that, we brought back our friend, David Dufour. David, welcome to the show again. Greetings and salutations. Thanks for having me back. Sure. David, run us through your, your recruitment process. Yeah, so I use a, a, an interesting system that at its fundamental core is the same as any other. Uh, but basically what I do is I utilize uh, social media, organic, cost-free methods to generate interested agents. They may not even be licensed, but they find my content on YouTube and then uh, check me out, learn more about me, et cetera, and then eventually get taken into a sales funnel, like a recruitment funnel, I guess you can say, that educates them about some frequently asked questions. And then at, at the final about we meet, it's kind of a foregone conclusion they're going to proceed and then begin the contracting process. So it, it's a little different than what most agents do, but the elements still remain. You've got to have people to talk to. You've got to have a unique sales proposition that would in, excite the potential agent as to why they should work for you or not. And you've got to have a scale to it so you can talk to enough agents because not all of them you talk to are going to work. But in essence, it's the same as any other system. But essentially, you, you, you put out lots of content and it's understandable. You're, bu you're building your figure of authority and people start looking at the, the go-to guy in order to then, then see your sales proposition. That's fine. The problem that I have is that I find that most people are just looking for a job. They're not entrepreneurs. They're just looking for an easy way out. I don't like you to comment on this because I'm sure you, you see this as well. So you're in, you're in Portugal, right? Yeah. How many... What percentage of the population in Portugal do you think owns a business? It's very little. It's very little. Most people are not entrepreneurs. They're just like, they're, they're more taker, takers than givers. Yeah. So we, we have the same setup here. And it's, it's like that everywhere. Most people, what they want is a job. They want to have a secure income. They want to have benefits. They want to have a defined career path. Problem is, is if you get into any sort of insurance sales, it, it really doesn't match that unless it's some unique arrangement. So I think by default, what you're going to run into is the same problem anywhere anybody in the world would run into if you're recruiting. And it's that the vast majority of people you talk to just aren't going to make the cut for the kind of characteristics you need to be successful uh, in, in an insurance sales career. So for me personally, the, the solution it's kind of like insurance, you know, selling insurance. You've got to have more people to talk to. You've got to fill up your pipeline with potential prospects. I think also what would be useful too, this goes for anybody recruiting, is to develop some kind of content. You don't have to do a full course content strategy like I do, but it's good to put some content out there to just validate who you are, to give more information on what you do, to, to humanize yourself with people, so that you can help people see in a bigger picture than just another job. Maybe think about, you know, the potential to make a great living, to have freedom in their life. So it, it, I think by default, Diogo, there's really no way to get around it. I think you're going to always be talking to way more people than um, those who will actually be a good fit. And it's just kind of a part of the machine. I've, I've been developing content, but on the Portuguese end, and if you look to my website, the Portuguese one, you'll see lots of content. And I've been getting some, some good uh, SERP results on Google because it started to rank now, because it's like the go-to guy for life insurance here in Portugal. So ranking and the long tail keywords for that. But the content is orientated, is focused on clients, not on recruiting people. Because best experiences, I don't, I don't see it working here. I do see it working in the US, though. I see what you're doing. I just don't see how he it working here. Because most people here, it's like I said, it's like a critical mass thing. The US is much larger than Portugal. And here, what, I, what I've been seeing in, from past experiences, I see that most people are just looking for a job. So... When you go about and try to recruit people, what I have been finding is that you find two types of people, essentially. One is you. So you're like looking to, for yourself and obviously you would take the job, right? And others are ones they like on part-time and that kind of fits the, the AL Williams model. 
Yeah, yeah. So comment on that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree. Um, in fact, it was it was art at A.L. Williams and Primerica that really popularized the, as we would call today, the side hustle of selling insurance. And uh, that, that still remains today. I mean, one of my my most visited web pages is how to sell insurance part time. So a lot of people look at this business. And again, this goes back to that whole job mentality thing. You know, they see there's opportunity, but they also see the risk of loss. What if I lose my job where my income secure and I jump into this thing that is insecure, but certainly much more higher ceiling. I can earn a lot more if I do well, but this is all conditional. It's if, if, if. So a lot of people look at this as trying to, you know, get the best of both worlds and start part time. And I think you can facilitate uh, a recruitment strategy around that. I think that's fine. A lot of people are conducive to that. Some agencies won't agree with me on that, and I respect that in the sense that they want you, they want the agent entirely, completely committed. And if they're not, they feel like there's always a plan B, right? They can go back to their job. So if they get a little bit of resistance or struggle, they can just rely on what they know versus, you know, growing and going through the difficulty. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, for me personally, I support the part-time strategy. I started the business part-time. Um, I would not have gotten into this business full-time immediately because I had a business, another business that was still making me money. So it just, to me, it's just, it just comes down to the same point made earlier. It's a numbers game. You've got to have enough t people to talk to, but there, I, I, and I don't know how it is in Portugal, but in, in the U S I would say at any given time, probably 25% of the employed population hates their job. I mean, not, not like doesn't mind it, but hates it. They only go there because they're afraid of the consequences. So there, there is an inherent desire for those people to find something better. So business opportunities like ours are a really good opportunity because people just, you know, they just get fed up and eventually they just don't know what to do. So we have a solution for them. And I would imagine there's probably something somewhere on your side of the Atlantic. When people get in your funnel, do you do you eventually like call, uh, call them and we have a conversation, a real conversation like we are having? Are you looking for a certain personality type or you just accept someone just because they are interested? Yeah, great question. So this is the million dollar question. Uh, if I knew the answer to this, I would have been retired by now. <laughs> you know, I yeah, have no. agents that came from manual labor, they worked in, you know, construction, you know, contracting. I've had agents that have trained horses professionally that have done very well, uh, certainly from, you know, business, business to business sales, uh, direct sales. I, I don't really know. It's, it, it, there's, it's very hard to decipher. Uh, for me and my agents, I can just tell you what I do. What I look for is an agent to put some skin in the game. To me, you know, a lot of people talk a good game about how they want to be financially free, how they want to run their own business, but they lack the courage to actually take action on that claim. I agree. And for example, when I worked at Aramark, which is a, it's a, it's a global company, but it's stationed in the U.S. They do what's called uniform services. I remember riding along with a, a route manager, a route tech. He drove the truck with all the uniforms in it. And he told me how much he despised what he did. It worked all these crazy hours. He couldn't ever do anything that he wanted. His dream was to work at a place here locally called Tennessee Valley Authority. It's a federal job, pays very well, good benefits. Um, that was in 2011. I remember driving down the road one day selling insurance. I, I had a sense left the job and it was a couple of years later. And I passed the same guy on the road and there he was four or five years later in his truck driving to his route. So this guy who was frustrated, you know, never left his job. He, he just hated it. So, you know, for me, it's just, I don't know what the profile is of somebody who is successful, but if you can put skin in the game, if you can take action in a substantive way with your own money and invest in yourself, I don't know if you're going to be successful. It's not a guarantee at all, but it's somebody I want to help because they're willing to step forward in a way that 95% of, of, of the American population never will. So that's my kind of metric, you know, um, beyond that, I just don't know. Let's run us through the process. So let's say, let's call him John. So John watch, uh, read some, some of your articles. He got, got him interested. 
he got in contact with you. So I imagine there would be a, a call. And then what? So, so here's how it works. So they find my content, usually digest a ton of it. Then they go to my website, go into a funnel, which is basically, if you can think about it, it's a frequently asked question type of educational video series. Okay. Once they do that, then they come on to a group consultation where I talk to them, that person plus a number of others, uh, and take their questions and clarify, clarify things a little bit further. And then only if they're interested in moving forward do I invite them to set a time up to speak with me. So at that call, again, I've already pretty much closed them, if you will, if you think about it like that. There may be just a handful, three to five remaining questions that need to be ironed out. And maybe two out of three that I talk to on the phone eventually move forward. And that's defined at this point of contracting to, to select the carriers, to get into the learning process. Uh, and and that's, kind of, that's kind of the strategy. You know, you don't have to do a group presentation. I do it because I now have less time than I had even a year or two years ago. So this is a way to conserve my time. As you find in, in sales, especially, or recruiting, once your time and your inventory is maximized, you're going to have to pre-qualify your prospects a little bit. So you can spend more time with the more qualified ones. And so that's the strategy I employ. But you don't need to do all that. You can simply just you know, find a strategy to get interested prospects and then just talk to them on the phone, do an interview, learn about their background, ask some questions. And I can go into what kind of questions you could ask to see if they might be a good fit. Yeah, let, let's go. Let's go through this. Because like I said, this session is really practical. It's the type the bin device in order to, to help people move forward with this. So one question I would ask is, what kind of success have you seen in your life? So I think maybe a good predictor of success in our industry is any kind of prior success based off of a performance activity. So that could be they were successful at another sales job, unrelated to insurance even. Or maybe if it's a young person who has no work history professionally, Maybe they, uh, you know, were a profet you know, maybe they played in college uh, b basketball, baseball, football, whatever. It doesn't matter the sport, but they performed at a high level. And the, the understanding there is they have an understanding of discipline, of work ethic, of focus, all of these characteristics which are necessary to, to do well. Um, another question to ask is what was the last book that you read? Or if you want to get a little bit more specific, what was the last self-development book that you read? The reason we ask that is, is that, especially if it's self-development, we want to know if this person is interested in growth, if they're self-interested. Can they explain to us about what they learn? It's not so much about what they learn, but are they taking action on improving and bettering themselves without somebody yelling or screaming at them like in a job environment? Like for me, I can tell you the last book I read was a W. Clement Stone book about positive mental attitude. You know, read it too. some things I learned about it, you know, like personally interacting with the other people. You know, I can do that because I do that occasionally. So if you have an applicant that does that, they're already invested in making themselves a better version of themselves. That's, that's a good thing too. Um, you know, um, maybe ask a question, you know, describe the last time in your life that you failed at something? What was it and how did you manage it? Again, because what is insurance sales but a lot of rejection and people telling you no more often than yes. So how are you gonna handle resistance? How are you gonna handle you know, um, that kind of thing? And again, what we're looking for, people are predictable. You know, they, do, they have a behavior pattern that replicates itself. Uh, so a person who does had done certain things in the past in a certain way is likely to repeat that process. Um, it's, it's, as I've discovered, it's kind of uh, childish or amateurish to think that somebody's going to do anything different than they always have. So you can kind of depend on what they did in the past to be a good predictor of the future. So those would be three questions I think that are really good of asking because what you're going to find is if they're self-disciplined, if they're a performance-based person, if they handle adversity well, that's kind of the tenant to somebody who is entrepreneurially driven, who is self-sufficient. And these are all things that an insurance model will be attractive to them, right? Because of uncapped earning capability, 
run their own business the way they want to completely performance based. So I think that's and, a good place to start. Yeah. And, and then, and then how do you go about and keep in, uh, keep uh, touching bases with them? So it's like you schedule another appointment for the next week and keep doing that on a recurring basis. For, a, for an applicant, a potential applicant. Sure, let's call John. John, you accept that John, he signed the paperwork, and now let's say on Friday, so next week, what's the plan for John? So you, you need to develop as an agency owner a, a basically a playbook of what to do and how to progress a new hire through whatever requirements you need them to satisfy to be prepared to sell. I will say this, um, there is a big drop off between the person who shakes your hand and says they're going to move forward versus the one that actually sits down with their first prospect and sells. Uh, that certainly is the case in my agency well as well with most. So what you have to do really is, is what do you do between those, that period of time to improve the amount who are interested at their peak level get to the point of taking action. One thing you can do is you need to set again, along with the playbook, a definitive deadline of taking action. This is a business of selling insurance, Diogo, where you don't learn by reading a book. It helps. It gets you up to date. Certainly, I'm a guy who has books behind me that I've written and I think they're helpful. But the ultimate and, most, and the best teacher is actual experience in front of prospects. And the sooner that you shorten that, that amount of time between interest and action, the sooner you're, you're going to see if this person you recruited will actually pan out. What you don't want to do is put somebody in an undefined process where they have control of taking all the time they want, they feel is necessary, because sometimes what you'll come across are perfectionists, as we like to call them. Uh, they want everything to be just so, and they want to spend an inordinate, unnecessary amount of time learning this business before they take their first strike. In my agency, we put a two week, possibly three week deadline on an agent getting started. There's no reason with the amount of material we have and what we teach that an agent can't be prepared well enough, not perfect by any stretch, but well enough to be ready to sell in the field. So by putting that deadline on it and then telling them, if you don't take action by this deadline, you're not going to work with us. It motivates those people a little bit more and I think what we find is there's more agents on the, on the backside that actually get out there and apply themselves, which is ultimately, since we don't make money until they make a sale, that's what we want, that's what they want, and it's a good thing. And you find it works, you up them like the commission level if they perform, let's say they sell their first 10K or something, and then you change from certain percentage to a different percentage, you have yeah. been having good experiences with this approach? So, so this is a good topic to talk about because there's a, di a couple of different strategies here. Um, what you find in the States, there's a big, I would call it, I don't know if you have it over there, multi-level marketing influence. And, and that, what that means are these, there are these large organizations that recruit hundreds, if not thousands of people every month. And the way that they, they structure their commission level advancements is very much like a ladder. Um, they give, uh, they start agents really low versus what you could get with an organization like mine, but they show them this process and they name like, you know, you're an agent, then you're a master agent, then you're a vice president, then you're senior vice president. So there's kind of this presumed prestige as you hit these levels, but they, you get these progressions up where, you know, as you hit certain production goals or you recruit and then the production goals based off recruiting you get to elevate yourself. Um, there's some psychology to this that people are inspired by seeing this mountain to climb. Even though it's arbitrary and made up by the company, and even if it's not, in the, it's not the best deal for the, the agent, uh, having something to work for and strive for is a motivator, especially for a performance-based person, that they can see themselves climbing the ladder and then getting these prestige awards. So I would suggest anybody who's creating an agency to give this thought, how do you structure it? I, frankly, for myself, uh, I'm very, uh, how do you say, I don't really have this big ladder to climb, as I would call it. I start agents at a flat level. They write 50 applications. It goes up a notch. Then there's some production goals above that. But there's not this, like with many organizations, you'll see them. There's 10, 15 levels they can climb. And 
but it's ultim it's funny because it's ultimately bad for the agent, but in my opinion, in a lot of cases. But uh, either way, for the agency, you should think about that because people want recognition. They want to know there's a challenge for them. They want to know what to expect. That's another important thing. Okay, here's my commission. What does it take to the next level? They want to know how to get better. So if you provide in writing some sort of guideline, you're going to find that um, more people will adhere to it and it will excite more people to take more action. Gotcha. Because I, I feel well, as I'm listening to you, it's like going through a little bit of an entrepreneur story because they might be struggling with money. And most people are, I've been noticing that as people are trying to get in the agency. So the main question here essentially is like from the get go, they don't have any money to buy leads. I'd like to hear some thoughts regarding this. Yeah. So most people get into insurance sales out of desperation. <laughs> I know I did. Uh, I had nothing to lose or very little to lose when I decided to sell life insurance. And, and I think this is, this is a trend in this business. Um, why is that the case? I don't know. I mean, it is a risky endeavor. You know, in most cases, you have to find your own prospects, either paying money or prospecting. So, and, you know, everybody wants benefits, the same things we talked about earlier. So. Uh, but, um, you know, um, how do you deal with agents who can't get leads? So this is, this is why a lot of the big organizations teach you to do what's called your project 100 or project 200. Yeah, I know. I know. Sounds about like it. you're familiar with it. Yeah. Because, I know about it. And, and it works. It's, it's a very good system, but it, you know, again, I don't know if this is, a, this is a deal over here and not there, but a lot of people here stateside don't like to do that because they don't want to come off to their friends and family members as beggars or somebody that's trying to take advantage of them. They want to sell people they care about. They're afraid they won't ever pick the phone up again or respond to their text messages again, you know? But the thing is, is here, here in America, most people don't have enough insurance. There's a need for more. And everybody wants to do business with people they already know, like and trust. So a project 100 or 200 strategy is really good especially for agents that have no money for leads or that are scared to invest money. You can have money, but then feel like, well, is this even a, a, a safe endeavor? What if I don't get my money back? And that's a perfectly understandable um, objection. So the project 100 to 200 is a good strategy to use. Um, it's a good way to learn the business. If you don't have money for leads, or don't want to spend it. Um, in a safe manner, you're selling people who already like you that are gonna be more patient with you as you start to learn. So it's easier to learn the business on friends and family. And they're more likely to refer to. You know, many times, hopefully, your friends and family wanna see that you'll be successful in life. So they're more willing to give you names of people that are gonna be, um, you know, possible prospects as well. So that's kind of what I would suggest for a new agent without money to invest in leads is find an organization that does a good job of teaching that be okay with it. It's not nearly as a big a deal as you, as you think it is because you're, you're, you, the people you know probably need more insurance. They just don't, they just, they think they have enough or they avoid the conversation and put it off.